Good morning, Bella Expression Photo Booth. Welcome, Vanessa, the Vanessa Project. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thanks for being with us, good morning. Jeff, happy Father's Day, brother. Sheila, good morning. Senor Jeezy, good morning, brother. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, guys. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Excited. Another beautiful day. Let's go. Good morning. Good morning. Wake up. Wake up. Yes. Good morning. Thanks, bro. Thanks, David. Appreciate it, bro. Good morning. Claudia, how you feeling? Good morning. Wake up, Mario. Tell him get up. Good morning, everybody. George Perez, 661. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Buenos dias, everybody. Good morning. Sunday, another fun day. Here we go. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, it's going to be a good one today, man. We're going to talk about parenting. Uh, I'm going to talk to you dads specifically, but moms, you too, right? You, that includes you. Parenting involves both, right? So, hey, good morning. Thanks for being here as people are jumping on. Thanks for, uh, you know, checking us out this morning. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Hey, let some people know that we're on live. I know some dads are enjoying this weekend, taking this weekend, uh, off completely enjoying the maybe the river the lake uh let me know guys what are you guys gonna do some barbecuing gonna go out to a restaurant i want to know what are y'all doing talk to me love to know what your plans are for today for those of you that have obviously dads um what are you gonna do with your pops what are you gonna do with this guy and um i also want to lift up uh yeah it's a new day brother yeah man my man uh, jordan felice Golfing, <laughs> Jenna said golfing. <laughs> oh my gosh, she's making fun of me, yes. Alicia, I left my heart in New Mexico. Welcome, good morning, everybody. Well, I just wanna thank you all for being here. It is officially, believe it or not, the start of summer, and man, boy, has it felt that way, right? Um, but happy Father's Day, uh, happy Father's Day, guys, to all of you, God bless you. Um, man, I want to pray for you guys. Those of you that um, are going to be fathers too as well. Uh, those of you that are father figures. I mean, you name it, right? Uh, I just want to, you know, bless you guys. Uh, thank you so much for, for all that you do, you know, for pursuing the Lord. Uh, first and foremost, for strength, for endurance, for wisdom, for the courage, for spiritual, um, you know, tenacity to lead your family spiritually. Because uh, remember, everything falls on you. You're the leader, right? Along with your spouse, but God will hold you accountable. Um, you know, one day, you know, he's made you the leader of your home. Um, so um, let me pray for us and pray for dads. And also, if you got a text message yesterday, uh, we'd like to pray for Monica and Angela's uh, dad who's in the hospital. Unfortunately, he has a, he had high blood pressure. He was struggling with that. I'm um, getting an update today. Uh, he had a brain hemorrhaging as well. Uh, there's been some uh, some struggles that he's got with his health. So please, uh, his name is Hector. Keep Hector in your prayers. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, good morning. Thank you. It's a new day. Uh, we're so grateful you know, that you've given us life today. Father, we ask that uh, you bless all the dads out there, um, regardless of, of you know what's going on in their lives we pray god that they know that you are that you are graceful that you are merciful that you are all good and you're all sufficient and so lord i pray that they enjoy not only this day but every single day knowing that they have been placed in a place of spiritual leadership a place of um you know also of 
managing and being good stewards of their families, their jobs, everything that you've blessed them with, you know, their possessions. May they understand and know that everything's to be used, not for their sake, but for your glory's sake, for your kingdom. And so God, I uh, pray that you give us all wisdom, uh, discernment, give us uh, courage to continue to spiritually lead in a culture that is vastly and drastically changing, uh, darker, and help us to be beacons of light. And so, God, I just uh, lift up Hector right now and anyone who is uh, sick, who uh, needs prayer. Uh, you are the great physician. And so, God, we pray for your miracle uh, touch on everyone's life that is struggling with any health issues, you know, even dads that are out there. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everybody. All right. Gina W1, welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, appreciate you, you know, tuning in. Uh, everyone on Facebook, thanks for being on here. Let me check, make sure that we are on still live. We don't have any uh, technical issues. Okay. Hey, so I just want to, uh, before we move forward, I want to give a special shout out and welcome uh, those of you that are here for the first or maybe second time back. Thank you for, uh, you know, spending about an hour of your time with us. Um, if you're new with us, please let us know um, by filling out. There's a connection card at the end of the message. If you're on Instagram, there's a link in our bio. It's called LinkedIn. Uh, fill that out. You know, let us know. Hey, I'm new here. It'd be great to know that. Hey, you're new here if it's the first, second time, and uh, we're gonna send you a special gift. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but let me tell you, you want to receive this gift, okay? If you fill out the connection card, also uh, on Facebook, uh, they're gonna post it in the comments. You know, yeah, it, there's a, a, a connection card. Fill that out. We'll send you a special gift. Okay. All right. Well, today uh, we're wrapping up this series okay normally we do a sermon series that's three weeks uh four or five weeks i did one that was about 13 weeks long it was awesome uh you can go back and check them out in our youtube channel but uh we're wrapping up this series today called the gender war okay it's been uh, three parts and this is the final one so if you're here today don't worry about it um you know we're going to take a look at many issues today that are related to gender and parenting Okay, and and here's some some questions that I want you, you know, to uh, actually that we're going to be tackling today. Um, first one is: Is it okay for my older daughter, if you have an older daughter, to dress her little brother like a girl? <laughs> is it bad if my daughter is a tomboy? Do I raise my kids gender neutral? Uh, do I let them choose their gender? You know, what do I do if they say that? That they don't want to be a girl or if my son says I don't want to be a boy anymore and what do I do if they tell me that they identify with a sex other than their biological sex another way in other words the way they were born you know do I go along with it do I take them to a gender clinic and allow them to get on puberty blockers uh, yeah there's parents that are doing that uh, do I allow them to get surgery if I if I don't Will they become suicidal, right? That's the first thing they tell you, you know, a lot of these children become suicidal. And just how much self-determination is a child capable of or should I grant them as a parent? And so, so these are the questions of our day, right? And, and particularly for parents. And, and as mentioned, you know, we've been in this series on all things gender. And so before we tackle the, the parenting challenge, I just wanna do a quick recap for those of you again that are here brand new, uh, even for some of us here, right, that, that we've been showing up. Uh, and, but if you're just joining us and if you're interested in how we arrived at what I'm gonna recap, then you're gonna to wanna to listen into past messages, okay? And again, you can check them out on our YouTube channel, The Well of AV, okay? The Well of AV has all the messages there. Um, or you can just wait on Facebook and go back and you'll see them on there. But here's what here's what we've explored over the last couple of weeks, okay? See, when it comes to sex, you need to remember that science and the Bible, both science and the Bible are of one accord, they're of one mind. And they they believe, okay? The Bible along with science believe that that sex is rooted in our biology. In other words, the way we're born. And when it comes to gender, our gender is our sex and our sex is our gender but there's this growing uh this cultural movement to to view sex and gender as distinct 
right, from one another. And the growing idea is that that gender is separated from sex and has to do with the psychological, the social and the cultural aspects of being male or female. And you can break that definition down into two very uh, different categories. There's gender roles and then gender identity. And so what are gender roles? Well, gender roles, again, are described as the, the social and cultural aspects of being male or female. In other words, all things related to masculinity and to femininity. And this is all largely built around, you know, stereotypes. Like, like the, the early 19th century rhyme. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this rhyme about boys. Uh, you know, boys are made of snips and snails and puppy dog tails. <laughs> and girls are made of sugar and spice and, come on somebody, everything nice. Yes. But again, these roles and, and these stereotypes, they're generalities. They're not absolutes. And they have nothing to do with whether you are, in fact, a male or a female. But then... Check this out. Then there's the gender identity. Okay, those are gender roles. Now we're talking about gender identity. And, and gender identity has to do with the psychological aspects associated with being male or female. Uh, what, what is someone's internal sense of, of self, meaning as a male, female, or check this out, both. Someone may think that they're both, male or female, or neither. So which which is what brings us to the transgender issue. Okay, so the word again transgender, it has become a, an umbrella term. Okay, you got to remember that it's an umbrella term for various ways that some people experience an incongruence between the way they were born, their biological sex, and their gender. Okay, so either their gender role or, or gender identity. Now, when there is true gender dysphoria i left you some homework last time so i hope you uh checked out that those that terminology right gender dysphoria when someone when someone really has that okay someone really does they, they look in the mirror thanks bro appreciate it real realtor joe in the house someone really does look in the mirror though and they see a man's body right and and they, they simply don't identify with or maybe they see a woman's body that they don't identify with and so their internal sense of self doesn't match with what they see in the mirror, okay? Their biological sex. Now, remember, I also gave you a statistic, though. People who identify as transgender, they only make up 0.5%. That's half of a percent, everyone, of the population. And what has developed of late in, our, in the cultural shift no longer feels... <clears throat> that is something to be fixed or healed or cured. Please remember that, okay? But instead, it's something that people are affirming and they're also enabling children, I mean, as young as four years old, five years old. So my question then is this, where does that leave things in terms of the Bible and where Christianity would land? Where does it leave it? Well, one of those things I, I've said th throughout the series is that one of the first things that needs to be understood is that if you struggle with this, okay, hear me out. If you struggle with an incongruence between your biological sex and what you feel or think in here, you need to remember that you matter to God. Please hear me again. You matter to God, okay? He, and he loves you dearly and he wants to meet you where you are and, and, and begin to take you on the journey that, that will most honor him because he is your creator right he is the, the the one that made you and he wants to bring wholeness and health to you please don't forget that and second while, while, while there should be great compassion i believe firmly from the church for for people that are suffering with any type of brokenness such as gender dysphoria that's what we're talking about see the bible would clearly guide us away from letting that dysphoria determine who we really are as men and women. Please don't disregard that. Because while there should be acceptance of, of people that are struggling with gender dysphoria, and, and, and let me tell you, they're really, they're, they're very real challenges that they face. You know, that doesn't mean everybody that there's a, a blanket affirmation of the various ways that people can respond to their dysphoria. And as a result, the Bible never, listen, the Bible never condemns people, 
right? Trans people, I should say. What it condemns is the actions of choosing to live in denial of their biological sex. So, uh, so hear me out. Rather than dressing, uh, you know, as the opposite of our sex or pursuing hormones or or surgeries to alter the our biological sex, right? Scripture would ask us instead to seek to accept our biological sex as as the way God made us to be. All right. So our brokenness again isn't immoral. Our brokenness. Let me repeat that isn't immoral, but there are moral choices that flow from how we respond to our brokenness. Please don't forget that. And I said this last week, right? We're all spiritually broken. Can I get amen to everybody out there? Hearts and some likes. We are all spiritually broken. We're the church. None of us are perfect. There are no perfect people in the church, everybody. Okay? And if you think you are, listen, you're in the wrong church. Let me tell you that right now. Okay? We're all spiritually disabled. And here's the thing. We all need to bring whatever we're struggling with to the cross, to Jesus including gender dysphoria, right? And we need to bring it to the leadership of Christ and, and live out our life in a way that honors him. So if you're trans, God's call on your life is to, is to help you get the help that you need to manage, okay? To manage your, your gender dysphoria in light, listen, in light of a relationship with Jesus and, and to surround yourself with people who, who are gonna serve you to help you live in accordance with your biological sex. Now, I know that was a lot fast. I, we talked, I mean, we went through a lot, terminology and all that. And, and if you're joining us for the first time in this series, again, um, thank you for being here. And I know it leaves out the journey for, for how we got to all of these conclusions and the journey matters, okay? And so if you will go back, please, and listen to the previous uh, messages, if you missed any of them, it's gonna it's gonna help you tremendously, okay? But now, so as, as we wrap up this series, I believe it's time to explore all things parenting in relation to gender. And specifically, um, the rapid rise of gender dysphoria among young people, and, and young girls in particular. Young girls, so let's jump in, okay? So beginning with what is happening with the youth culture as a whole, because it is significant to this conversation. Bobby, good morning, man. Thanks for being here, brother. Happy Father's Day. Uh, listen, while while those who um, identify, while those who identify as transgender only account for again zero point zero point five percent of the population, when you analyze Generation Z, these are are are, are children or young adults now that were born between 1995 and 2010, essentially, you know, those that are between the ages of 11 and 26 right now, you're going to run head first into what is called sexual fluidity. Anybody ever heard that before? Sexual fluidity? It's our culture, right? It's, it's there. And so let me, let me try to flesh this out for you, okay? A recent Gallup poll, hear this, a recent Gallup poll found that Almost 6%, 5.6% 5, 5. of U.S. adults identify as LGBT. And you know, that's up from 4.5% in 2017, just about four years ago. Now further, the, the majority of the LGBT Americans say that they are bisexual, okay? But one in six, check this out, one in six adults in Generation Z, which I just mentioned, consider themselves LGBT. That's a 1% rise in those who identify LGBT. And, and most of them are bisexual. And it's not a, a particularly telling or significant, but it's a cultural uptick for sure, right? Now, however, listen to this, the Generation Z statistic, one out of every six identifying as LGBT is, it's a huge jump. It's a 15.9%, uh, uh, it's 15 .9 of the entire generation of Generation Z, everybody. That's huge, 16% almost. And the vast majority uh, of those, they say that they are bisexual. So here's my point. If you're a, a, uh, a cultural analyst and you wanna look at this through a social science lens, I mean, you're gonna ask yourself, what? 
is going on, right? What is going on with Generation Z? Why is it such an outlier, right? And, and it's not so much a true shift in, in sexual orientation as it is, everybody, a new openness. Hear me out. It's a new openness to all things sexual. You see, this is the generation that, again, has come up in an age in, in the era that, era that has put such, I mean, these types of things in the mainstream. You remember back in, in 2015, right? What had happened? Well, the Supreme Court, they legalized gay marriage. That was just six years ago. And then what happened with uh, Bruce Jenner? You guys remember that, right? In front of us in reality TV, right? The, this former Olympian um, uh, male, biologically sex male, you know, very publicly became Caitlyn Jenner. Now, so from this cultural context, Generation Z has become sexually and relationally amorphous. Okay, so consider Consider the, the influential statements uh, that even celebrities make, right? When they post stuff like uh, Kristen Stewart, you know, um, uh, she's from uh, Twilight or Miley Cyrus, right? Who's huge in pop culture. And, and so uh, Kristen Stewart, what she said is, um, you know, she said, I think that, I think in three or four years, this is what she said, there are gonna be a whole lot more people who don't think it's necessary to figure out if you're gay or straight. She, she continued, she said, it's like, just do your thing. Just do your thing. That's, that's what a lot of Generation Z, uh, you know, young adults and kids think, right? And then what did Miley, Miley, Miley Cyrus, to quote her, she said, I don't relate to being boy or girl. And I don't have to. I don't have to have my partner relate to boy or girl, you know, either. And, and so this is what I'm talking about by sexual fluidity. See, it's the refusal, everybody, of either... Uh, the homosexual or heterosexual label, the male or female label, right? The idea is that all labels are what? They're repressive, right? That sexuality should be set free from any and all restrictions and it should be allowed to follow its desire, right? It should be moment by moment. Like, you know, if I want to be, you know, straight today or, or, or right now and then later tonight when I go out, I want to be, you know, bisexual, whatever, right? Or it should be a feeling, right? If I feel this way, then I should be that way. And this is why you now have everybody, particularly among the very young, something different that would used to be deemed transgender or gender dysphoria. See, you have labels such as, Google these. These are, I look these up, man, it's, it's a trip. Gender expansive, look that up. How about uh, gender creative? or pan gender and and the list goes on and on and on i mean you can google this stuff well okay so we've talked about how how gender dysphoria is real and and can begin at a very young age but something is happening with generation z that is different and i've mentioned throughout the series that with all of my research i found the work of dr preston sprinkle okay and he's a president of the center for faith sexuality and gender i mean he, this was the most helpful for me i mean I, I literally knocked out his book in two days. It's a, it's a very uh, in-depth read, but it's easy to read too. It's not, I mean, there's a lot of information, but it really puts things in perspective. And, and, and again, I want to just thank him for, you know, his research and, you know, I'm indebted to him for, I mean, everything that he, that he wrote in that book. Um, and, and I mentioned a lot of it through the series. And I also want to thank, um, you know, Dr. Uh, James White, uh, for his messages and, you know, his uh, series also, um, it's helped me put this together. So again, I just want to, you know, tip my hat to them. But I want you to know that in his book, in Dr. Preston's book, Embodied, um, it's, it's a look into transgender identity, the church and, and what the Bible has to say. And he, there's a story in there. I, I can't, I couldn't let this story go. I need you guys to listen. It's a, it's a girl named Stephanie. And so Stephanie grew up as a stereotypical feminine girl on the autism spectrum. When she was 13 years old, she actually told her mother that she was transgender. And so Stephanie's coming out, if you will, her declaration seemed to come out of nowhere though. I mean, there had been no prior history of gender dysphoria, right? There was no tomboyish interest or, or behavior. And her mother did, however, find out that Stephanie 
had just heard a presentation. Check this out. She heard a presentation, 13 years old, about being transgender. Where? Where do you think, everybody? At school. At school. A school where where over 5% of the student population identified as transgender or non-binary. And so her mother, Carol, right, she took Stephanie to a gender clinic to seek counsel. And here's what, what uh, Carol said the clinician told her. This is, this is literally what the mom said. She said, I must refer to my daughter with masculine pronouns. This is what, the, what they told her at the clinic and call her by a masculine name and, and buy her a binder to, to flatten her breasts. And he recommended no therapy and there was no consideration of the social factors that obviously affected her thinking. In other words, the school pushing this agenda. And I was directed to put her on puberty blocking drugs. How crazy is that? Then she added, I was falsely assured that these drugs were well studied and that they were a perfectly safe way for her to explore gender. I was told that if I did not comply, she would be at a higher risk of suicide. And let me give you another story. Helena. Helena was 14 when, when she felt that she might be attracted to both boys and girls. And she began to explore what, what this might mean for her through online community on Tumblr. You guys got to be careful out there, parents. Right. It, it was there that she learned about various gender identities. She read story after story of people identifying as trans. And eventually she started relating to stories, these stories that she was hearing, and she began identifying as trans. Helena, right, again, not even a teenager, learned on Tumblr that taking testosterone, again, this is on social media, was the next step that she had to take as a trans person. And so she began cross-hormone therapy, or CHT. And then she found that getting the testosterone was easy. Listen to this. All it took was one hour, everybody's 60-minute consultation, one hour with a counselor who asked her about her dysphoria. And you know, looking back on it, Helena said, I had all these rehearsed answers that I didn't genuinely believe. But it was really popular for the trans community to help each other. Listen to this. Rehearse the answers and tell each other what to say to the doctors. So Helena was on CHT for two years. And it wasn't long before problems began popping up. Again, let me, let me just speak for her, what she said. She said, it's a common thing for women on testosterone to experience a lot of anger. Then there's the weird phenomenon where you get upset and you want to cry, but you can't cry. And eventually these kinds of problems started getting more apparent and I started feeling miserable. She says, I was angry, like all the time. Everything made me angry. I felt like I had been put through the ringer with all these emotional changes. She said, it really messed my mental health. She also learned that high doses of testosterone in females often cause their ovaries and their uterus to atrophy after about five years. Helena was miserable emotionally, physically, and mentally, everybody. And at some point, she remembers that she just had to, to say that this was not working. And so ultimately, Helena decided to detransition, everybody, to detransition back to a female. And, and what happened is in the last few years, uh, stories like Helena's and Stephanie's, they have grown tremendously, again, especially in little girls, right? And some are calling this the rise of dysphoria in teens, a significant and real trend. I mean, psych psychologists have actually termed this trend. They call it rapid onset gender dysphoria or ROGD. Again, rapid onset just gender dysphoria. And this is a new phenomenon. And so classical gender dysphoria usually is apparent at a young age, even as young as the ages of two, right? Two and four, when they begin to grasp that, that biologically they are a boy or girl. Okay, so, so the vast majority, everybody, they grow out of this by the time they hit puberty, but it's, it's almost always been an early onset. And so what's happening today is, is late 
onset dysphoria among children, right? Often after puberty. And it's, and it's, it's seeing a sudden leap, particularly among young female teens. To let you know how big of a spike, um, the Travis Stock Center in London, which is the main gender clinic in the United Kingdom, they treated 17, I want you to hear these statistics, okay? They treated 17 females in 2009, and they treated 1,740 females uh, in 2019. And so that's a, a 5,000, listen to this, 5,000 increase among females in just 10 years. And so research on, on ROGD among teens has found some interesting dynamics. Let me give you some of these. They found that few of the children showed any signs of gender dysphoria to their parents growing up. That's one. Their new identity seemed to appear out of the blue. Many, if not all of these children uh, uh, um, of their friends at school, they were trans. They had friends that were trans and they were coming out often following uh, their friends coming out as trans. Many of them became more popular. That's huge. They, they love popularity after they came out as trans. They engaged in heavy online and social media activity. Okay, again, more than normal surrounding their, their coming out. Many of them had other mental uh, concerns, health concerns that weren't de uh, being dealt with. And the last one is the most significant, ready? Here's what the study found. 63% had one or more diagnoses of a psychiatric disorder or a neurodevelopmental disability preceding the onset of gender dysphoria. Here's, here's the breakdown, ready? 48% had experienced a traumatic or stressful event prior to their onset of gender dysphoria. 45% were engaging in non-suicidal self-injury prior to the dysphoria, like cutting. They were cutting themselves. 15% had been diagnosed with ADHD. 12% had been diagnosed with OCD. 12% uh, were on the autism spectrum. 7% had an eating disorder. 7% were bipolar. Again, all of these were present before the kids came out as trans. And get this, when these kids were, were taken to a gender therapist or a physician to explore transitioning, listen to this number, 72% never explored issues of mental health or previous trauma or any alternative causes of gender dysphoria before proceeding with assisting the transition. See, even when they were informed by the parents of previously um, having uh, been diagnosed with mental health issues, I mean, that's crazy, right? And the study also found that the children believed through what they had read online and been told by others that transitioning would solve their problems. Come on. Hey, if you transition, you know, if, if, if whatever you're thinking here, you know, turn, let it become physical, like go for it. They, they, they're told that transitioning will solve their problems, even their previous mental health issues. In other words, that that was the golden ticket. So here's my point. If you add all of this up, you have this new sexual fluidity Right, the first generation growing up online and a spike in gender dysphoria at a late age often preceded or accompanied with peer pressure. Toward what? Toward that dysphoria and it's accompanied by mental health issues. Please don't miss that. Listen, church, this sounds more, you know, like more of, of a parenting issue then, then than get them to a gender clinic to transition issue, doesn't it? Come on, right? So let's talk about what to do as parents. Here's where we're going to nail this down. Dads, moms, you got to hear me out on this. First, when it comes to gender roles, hear me out, please. I want you to take a, a big breath right now with me. And just relax. Okay, just relax. You see, gender roles, we talked about this, I think, in the first week. I mean, these are largely built on stereotypes, right? I mean, anybody who's raised kids, and I've raised kids, trust me, I, I've raised three that are 18 or over already, and now I'm raising in the next three, yep, that are 12 and under. 
And you all know that that boys sometimes when they have sisters, right? They'll they'll dress up as girls and they'll they'll play with dolls and and, and the girls will do the opposite, right? They'll dress up as boys and play with a lightsaber, right? And and throw a football with the boys. And I've even seen you know big sisters, you know, going to dress up their their little brother and and have a little tea party with him, and and he'll go along with a great big smile, knowing something's weird, right, on his face. But you guys know what that's called? It's normal, <laughs> right? It's called normal. And there are some girls who are more tomboyish, right? They don't like dresses. They like wearing jeans only. They don't want long hair. And I mean, but that doesn't mean that they aren't girls. So don't be ruled. That's what I'm saying. Don't be ruled by stereotypes, right? Their maleness or their femaleness is rooted in biology. And that should be upheld is what I'm saying. The way they're born, regardless of how much they fit the mold of current expectations of masculinity or femininity. In other words, how they're acting, right? You shouldn't feel weird about it as a parent and you shouldn't make them or allow anyone else to make them feel weird about it as a child. Now, guys, with that said, when it comes to gender identities, we're on, on much more serious ground. Please hear me out. When it comes to gender identity, yeah, see, I, I'm very concerned about what is happening when it comes to, to children and gender identity. See, children, they're being encouraged to come out as transgender at very young ages. And it's often connected with peer pressure, right? Or culture and, and the internet encouragement and, and mental health issues. And parents, I mean, I know you're feeling pressured. You're feeling pressured to immediately put them on cross hormone therapy on CHT. And, and you're often being told that it's that it's medically or psychologically necessary. And even for things related to gender roles, hear me out, gender roles versus gender identity. You see, according to, to one advocacy group uh, called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, children, everybody, who transition should include gender non-conforming individuals. Meaning, here's what it means, anyone who doesn't conform to gender stereotypes, such as a boy who prefers a violin to football. They're saying that that's a sign that he's, he's not really a boy and should consider transitioning to a female. I mean, isn't that, come on, man. Okay, look, we, we, have, we have, let's just call a timeout on this, okay? Let's call a timeout. You need to know that this is very dangerous. And it's very irresponsible. And let me read to you what Colin Wright, he's a, uh, a, a, an evolutionary biologist at Penn State. And also Emma Hilton, she's a developmental uh, biologist at the University of Manchester. And they wrote this in, in the Wall Street Journal op-ed piece. You know, they wrote about this. Here's what they said. I'm going to quote them. The most vulnerable to sex denialism are children when they're taught that sex is grounded in identity instead of biology, sex categories can easily become conflated with regressive stereotypes of masculinity and femininity. Masculine girls and feminine boys may become confused about their own sex. The dramatic rise of gender dysphoric adolescence especially young girls in clinics likely reflects this new cultural confusion. You hear that? See, the large majority of gender dysphoric youths eventually outgrow their feelings of dysphoria, dysphoria during puberty. In other words, affirmation therapies that insist a child's cross-sex identity should never be questioned. And puberty blocking drugs advertises a way for children to buy time to sort out their identities only, listen to this, only solidify feelings of dysphoria, setting them on a pathway to more invasive medical interventions and permanent infertility. This patholo patholo pathologizing <laughs> of sex atypical behavior is extremely worrying and regressive. Do you guys hear that? I mean, this is these are scientists, okay, and psychologists. Okay, so church, let me tell you, this is pretty straight up stuff, okay? Drugs and surgery 
or, or stopping puberty is not the way to raise a 12 year old girl that is wrestling with her identity, right? Or searching how to fit in at school. See, you're talking about life changing, life altering actions. And a 12 year old, everybody, with or without any pre existing mental health issues, is not in a place to make that decision for herself. I mean, just ask yourself, okay, let's, let's ask ourselves here. Is a teenager who's wrestling with their gender identity, along with other likely co-occurring mental health concerns, able to make an informed decision about undergoing irreversible surgeries to align their body with their perceived gender identity? Come on now. I mean, you've heard the statistics and the reality is our brains I mean, they're not fully developed until we're about the age of 25. Yet, what are we doing? We're giving cross-sex hormones to kids as young as 12 and performing double mastectomies on biological girls as young as the age of 13? Come on, man. I mean, we're removing their uterus and ovaries at 16 years old. All this as that there's an ongoing push to lower the age where kids can get hormones and surgery without their parents' consent. Did you know that currently in the state of Oregon, I mean, 15 year olds can medically transition without the consent of their parents? And, and if the parents protest, listen to this, they are told by counselors and activists that if their child doesn't transition, this is how they scare them, that the child will probably attempt suicide. I mean, literally, they're being asked, so do, do you want a, a living son or a dead daughter? And that by all research, I mean, it's just propaganda. It's a scare tactic and an outright lie, everybody. It's a lie. As one expert put it, the advice, transition or suicide. That's the terminology they're using. Right? This is neither psychologically nor ethically responsible. Now, in truth, as we learned last week, it is those who have transitioned who are the ones, listen to this, they're the ones who are most likely to become suicidal. For the ones who transition, the suicide rate increases, everyone. And this is what's being really underreported. See, the number of people who transitioned, thinking it, it would solve everything, right? And it didn't they were the most miserable. They were more miserable than before and are now detransitioning back or they're trying to. See, those seeking to, to return to their original state, you know what they cite? They cite the same reasons often touted in support of transitioning in the first place, right? Those wishing to reverse their gender reassignment have spoken out about experiencing, listen to this, crippling levels of depression following their transition. And in some cases, they even contemplated suicide. So what should parents do? Again, what should you do as a parent? Well, I hope by now it's obvious. One, number one, here's what you should do. You should be informed. Two, you should be involved. And three, you should be in charge. Let me say it again. You should be informed, number one. You should be involved, number two. And you should be in charge, number three. See, the proper assumption with parenting is simple, y'all. Your children, here it is, are immature and they need parental maturity. See, children are not little adults. They're not, they are children. See, to be informed is to know what is going on in your child's world. You gotta be up to date, right? You gotta be current, you gotta be knowledgeable. You gotta know what they're doing and who they're doing it with. You have to be involved, which means that you are part of their world. You're not just a spectator, right? You're not a participant. You're not a participant, mom and dad. So you gotta be in charge, which means that you are leading their world, right? You're creating their world, that you're shaping their world. They're, they're, they're your responsibility. Right, you, they, you're, you, you are the steward of your children to raise, if you're a Christian family, to raise them in Christian values. See, how does that play out with all things gender then, Pastor? 
Well, again, be informed. That's why I'm doing this series. I'm trying to inform you to get you to get to look more information, to look up stuff. You need to be aware of the phenomenon of what's going on, particularly among young girls. This, this, this rapid onset gender dysphoria, ROGD. And, and how much it's tied to peer pressure, everybody. Come on, parents. How much is tied into exposure of being online, right? To sites that encourage them to identify as trans, like Tumblr and, you know, TikTok. And I mean, you name it, right? Instagram. All the stuff that's currently existing with mental health issues and more, okay? Get involved. As I mentioned earlier, you know, many kids, you know, they're struggling with gender dysphoria, particularly this ROGD, this rapid onset gender dysphoria. And, and, and they have other issues going on, issues related to anxiety. Here's the mental health stuff, anxiety, depression, self-harm, right? They've gone through trauma or some sort of abuse. Maybe there's a, a breakup, right? Parents getting divorced. That's also, um, you know, causes issues related to mental health. Uh, maybe they feel isolated and weighed down by social pressures at school, right? They're turning to their peers, uh, to online communities because there's no one else involved. Hear me out, parents. No one else involved in their life and what they're feeling and going through. But they should be going to you, not social media, right? I mean, look at this. I mean, as we started talking about parenting, we dropped like three or four people. <laughs> I don't know, we're just going to say because it's Father's Day, but I mean, they should be going to you and, and you should be going to them, right? You should be the one most involved in their life. I'm not saying be a helicopter mom or dad, but ask questions, be involved in whatever they're going through. And more importantly, what they think they are going through. What are you going through? What's happening, right? And again, it can be as simple as making sure that they're coming to you with the questions, right? The other day, let me tell you something. There was a 12-year-old boy, and he was speaking with a pastor. And he said to the pastor, he said, Pastor, he goes, I'm wondering if I'm gay or, or trans. And the pastor said, well, tell me why. why. Why do you feel that way? He said, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I really like girls. Like, I'm, I'm not really attracted to girls, right? I, I'm not really sure I like them. And the pastor, you know, said, well, how old are you? He said, well, I'm 12. <laughs> and the pastor's response was like, well, I'm married with, with three kids now. And at 12 years old, I mean, I wasn't sure that I liked girls. But you know what that did, that conversation with this 12 year old boy? It put this boy at ease. And he told him, he said, look, he said, that's not a sign, my friend, right? That's not a sign. But it was, it was really troubling this young boy, this 12 year old boy. And listen, we, here's my point. We, we've just got to keep those kinds of conversations going with our children. Again, don't be, don't be tricked by this. When you have 0.5%, half of 1% of the population with gender dysphoria, but it's up to 15% or more of generation Z embracing it? Come on, somebody. I mean, something's going on, right? And it's not dysphoria. See, it's cultural. Trust me, it's cultural. You've got something being socially pressured or socially influenced. I mean, let's just talk about, you know, this month, June, right? The, the push of, you know, LGBTQ plus. I mean, I don't know, my question is, how does it happen when it's Father's Day, which is, again, I believe a cultural push against, you know, males, dads, you know, leading their families. Pride Month in the month of June. I mean, listen, here's, if you know your child has excessive internet use, I know we had to monitor it because I know it's been a drastic change. A lot of things have changed with the pandemic. You know, they went to school online, but if they, they have excessive internet use, especially social media, you need to know that when it comes to gender and sexuality, the internet, everybody, is a hot mess. Not only because of porn, right? And, and don't, make, mis don't make, make no mistake here, no other generation has had pornography so available in such degrees at such a young age as Generation Z. 
And did you know that the average age right now to view porn of, of kids is 11? Kids at 11 years old are viewing pornography. But also because of the sheer amount of time that's being spent, uh, that they're exposed to everything about sex and gender online, which again is a hot mess. And so when parents were surveyed, you know what they thought? They, they surveyed them and said, how long do your kids are usually on, on their phones? The average adult said, parents said, oh, about an hour a day. But you know what the study found? It found that while parents thought it was a little over an hour, the reality was that their children were on their phones or their iPads uh, for an average of three and a half hours a day. Three and a half hours a day, everybody. But here's the good news. Again, you're in charge of that. If you know that your child's friends are wanting to explore opposite sex identities, or you see them dressing in that way, guess what? You're in charge of that too, right? Meaning your kids, who they're hanging around with. See, every step of the way, parents, you're in charge. They are not, right? A gender clinic is not in charge. Their peers are not. Our culture is not. Can I get amen out there? I know some of you are probably bored with this, but let me tell you, this is imperative. This is important. You, you as a parent are in charge and you need to quit acting like you're not. Quit acting like you're helpless. So please, listen to me, step in. Listen, studies have shown that the vast majority of children who start to show transgender tendencies or other types of gender dysphoria, they will naturally grow out of it particularly if the parents don't cater to it. You guys hear me? If the parents don't cater to it. I mean, that really is the best counseling and advice that I can give to you as parents, right? Your child is not in charge. Some of us need to work on our codependency, right? Their friends are not in charge. Their school is not in charge. You, you are in charge. You know, at, at five years old, your child does not have any concept or understanding of gender, period, right? They, and they don't have much of it either at 12 or 13, right? They don't have the maturity, everybody, to make decisions or get in touch with who they are or who they're supposed to be. See, the, the entire enterprise of parenting is that is that they are immature and you, you should be the mature one right? That they desperately need your maturity. They, they need your leadership, your direction. And yes, guess what? Your control. Yes, your control. Okay, listen, I, I know that's a lot of information. And as I wrap this up, I hope that this message series has helped you. Um, I know that, that you may still have a lot of what if, what if, right? What if questions that we didn't get to. So again, I want to encourage you to go get the book called Embodied. Listen it listen to it on uh, on Audible, right? Preston Sprinkle is the author. Um, you know, it's the best one that I could recommend on this. I mean, it's a good book, really good. It's called Embodied: Transgender Identities, the Church and What the Bible Has to Say. Okay, so next week, all right. We're going to start a brand new series. I'm really Totally excited about it. It's going to be a total different feel and tone. Um, and we're calling it, What's Next After I Believe? What's Next After I Believe? Okay, so have you ever asked yourself, right, what's next in my spiritual development? Like, what's next? Right? And, and I believe it's essential, and it's the way that someone truly becomes a fully devoted follower of Christ. And so in this series, okay, starting next week, Next Sunday, I'm going to walk you through the basics of growing your faith, connecting with the church, and teach you how to have a solid foundation to build a vibrant, listen to this, life with Christ. So I want you to come back next week, okay? This series, again, if this is your first time joining us and you hung in there with me, um, you know, go back, listen to the messages on our YouTube channel, The Well of AV. But I want you to come back, and I also want to invite somebody next week okay, that may have questions about their faith, okay, uh, even you, thank you, Gina, W1, good service, pastor, amen, well, God bless you, I'm glad this blessed you, um, and so I want you, to, I want you to come back, okay, because we're going to talk about discipleship, what's the next step, I know there's a lot of new Christians, a lot of new people that have, you know, made the decision to follow Jesus, and you're like probably thinking, what's next, 
what do I do? Do I just tune in online? Like, like what's the next step? Do I go to a church, like physical location near me? I know you're probably watching from different places. Well, come on back, okay? We're gonna talk about that. Finally, I just wanna give you an update with our Kicks for Kids fundraiser. Hey everybody, let's give a huge round of applause or shout out or hearts and likes out there. We have raised almost $30,000. Come on, somebody. Of, of our $50,000 goal. Let me see some hearts and likes out there. $30,000 almost. I wanna thank all of you for posting, resharing our posts, uh, for forwarding the emails that we've sent out about the shoe drive, videos. I mean, I wanna thank all of you for uh, donating generously. Um, I have a story, Sheila Andel, who's probably still on here. You know, she uh, private messaged me yesterday and was like, Pastor, you know, I went around my office, you know, we're back at work, you know, and uh, I passed out the flyers that you mailed to us. And uh, we're really excited about it because I raised, listen to this, she raised $400 at her office, at her job. She went around with a flyer and told people about it. So proud of you, Sheila. And if you guys don't know Sheila, she is super shy. Uh, she wouldn't do this on a normal basis, but she's like, hey, it's all for the glory for God, his kingdom and these children. And so Sheila, I'm super proud of you. Thank you for uh, getting out of your comfort zone and uh, blessing these children. 400 bucks, everybody. I wanna invite you to do the same. So I just wanna pray for this offering. If you're ready to give, uh, give. Uh, you, can, you can click the, uh, the, uh, the fund that says uh, Kicks for Kids. Or if you're tithing, you can obviously give to tithes and offerings. But again, thank you. Uh, please continue to share all the information and invite others to give so we can bless a thousand kids with a pair of shoes. Let me pray for us and then we're out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that um, the science even agrees with your word with this, um, you know, with this gender war that we're in in our culture. And God, I just lift up all the parents, uh, mom and dads. And in this day, particularly, we lift up dads. Uh, I want to bless them. Have a happy Father's Day. May they continue to be the spiritual fathers and leaders, Lord, by following your example of leading with grace but with truth. And God, uh, we ask you to multiply our offering, our tithes and offerings, and use them, God, so that we can expand your kingdom, invite others into a relationship with you, a graceful, merciful Father that loves us, that created us, that created us male or female. And God, we rebuke this culture, um, you know, what is trying to push this agenda on um, making us believe that we are not our biological sex, that we are what we believe, what we think, what we feel. God, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, God, to continue to use us to lovingly invite people that are struggling, that they are welcomed into your kingdom because you created them and, and that you love them and you want them to have a relationship with you and you'll help them flesh this out. God, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. Again, thank you for being here uh, this weekend. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next weekend. We'll talk to you then. Happy Father's Day. Talk to you later, guys.